going to have next lecture by Rami Ismail. Uh, Rami presents. Yep. It's a good title. Uh, the mic is right here, I think. Oh, this is a mic. Okay, you got I can it. talk. I can. Is it by the right to Rami presents? Yeah, yeah, it's going to be a Showtime show. <laughs> Exclusive. Uh, let me move this up a bit because I'm a little bit tall. Oh, I cannot, yeah, but then I have to hold it. Yeah. I'm tired. I don't know if you went to the pre-party yesterday, but God, Poland does that differently than the Netherlands. Uh, screen. Yes. Oh, I need to click play. Hi. Uh, welcome. Good afternoon. Oh, that's a lot of light. It's fancy, though. I like that. Uh, my name is Rami Ismail. I'm one half of Dutch independent studio of Lambeer. We're the creators of games such as Super Crate Box, Ridiculous Fishing, Lift Rousers, and most recently Nuclear Throne. Is there anybody who needs or wants more intro from me than that? No? Everybody knows who I am and what I do? Good. That saves me the 15 minute intro. Um, so here's the thing I haven't been to Poland for a while, which means that I don't know too much about the situation for independent developers in Poland for, um, at the moment, which means that I could give you just a random talk that I sometimes give, but I felt that would be sort of unfair. So instead, what I decided is we're going to do a cooperative talk. Uh, so you're going to help me do this talk. Um, and the basic idea is that this is me, uh, but you know that. So you also know that this is my co-founder, so I don't have to tell you that either, that we made these games, that we started with eating cheap noodles. We made a game about fishing with machine guns. We made a game called Super Crate Box that got nominated for a bunch of awards, then made a shooter game on Venus, gave talks, made an RPG about Serious Sam. Started selling T-shirts. I'm wearing my own T-shirt. It's really cool. Uh, made a fishing game that did really well. Again, with machine guns. Uh, then that game got cloned. We didn't like that, uh, but we ended up making a little angry airplane game, also with guns. A lot of guns. Uh, and then Ridiculous Fishing came out, and it was the game of the year for Apple, and then we worked on Nuclear Throne. So everybody kind of knew that, right? Oh, God, more people. Do I have to restart? No. no? <laughs> Otherwise, I'm just going to blame it on you. It's, it's fine. Um, so here's the thing. Uh, for this talk, what I would like to do is I would like to go through my, my slides with you and then um, sort of figure out what you want me to talk about. Um, so we're going to do that. I'm going to ask you to tell me what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about that. So does anybody have anything they really want me to talk about? Independent development. Business. Ludo, no. <laughs> Ludo narrative dissonance is forbidden. That's the only one. Anything else? Just any. What? No. Let's do serious, serious subjects. Game development, please. Okay. So, um, those are more games as service. Games as service. I can talk about games as service. Anybody else who wants me to talk about games as service? Okay. There's three people. I mean, if you want me to talk about something, you should say so now, because for the next 40 minutes, I'm going to be talking about all the things that are going to be on these slides. So, anybody else? Nobody has any ideas? Anybody want me to talk about marketing? Marketing? Just by raise of hands? What about marketing? Pitches, publishing, talking to publishers, talking to the audience? Buying advertisements, what kind of subject? You can just yell at me, it's okay. QA! Let's, just, let's go with just marketing. Okay, anything else? This part of the press. Sorry? QA, QA for indie games. That's a good one. That'll be fun. I'll just cry during that slide for like five minutes. Anything else? We're just gonna do three slides? Work, first party for indies is a strange one, but working with third party is probably easier. There's not a lot of indies that go first party, really. Oh, working with, working with mobile platforms then. 
Okay. Business models. Business models. Okay. Outsourcing. Outsourcing. Okay. Go three more slides. Best platform, platform to choose for new developers. Platforms. Okay. VR. <laughs> 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 okay. Anything else? Going once, going twice. No, nobody other subjects. Maybe, maybe you, maybe you know something. I'm looking for subjects to talk about. In the apocalypse. In the apocalypse. Why? Why everybody's cloning nuclear throne? Yeah. Well, I can talk about roguelikes if that's something people want me to talk about. Yeah. Roguelikes. Okay, this is like the strangest talk. We're going to talk about... Yeah, these have nothing to do with each other. This is going to be great. <laughs> okay, okay. I'm okay with this. Uh, so, hi. My name is Rami Ismail, and this is uh, the cooperative talk. Uh, does anybody need me to do the intro? No? Okay. Yes, I work for Coca-Cola. How did you know? Uh, I also work for this noodle company, but I don't know their name. I guess it's Yum Yum. <laughs> Um, so, uh, presentation, presentation title goes here. Uh, games as a service. It's actually a really interesting subject. I don't know if you all have been paying attention, but how many of you, this is, this is a, obviously a personal perspective on this, how many of you think the traditional model of AAA in indie games is gonna stay for a very long time? Buy a game, get a game, play a game. Does one person think that? Two people? Three? How many of you think that that will remain the best earning way of making video games? Zero. Yeah. I guess this is sort of a very obvious one, but in the future, making games is going to include a lot more infrastructure and server work than it does nowadays. Uh, and you can actually see that happening with a lot of smaller services coming and growing right now, offering exactly those kind of services. Who here has worked with cloud stuff before? Just general cloud stuff, service stuff? One person? Okay. Why, why, did, why, did, this, why did this topic come up? <laughs> if two people want to know about it. All right. Um, what do you want to know about games as a service? How do you think it will evolve? How do I think it will evolve? Well, it will really rapidly become the standard, right? Games as a service is where games are going, whether we like it or not, because it's the best way of making money with a product right now. Uh, buying a game once is really cool, but in case you hadn't noticed, making a game and then selling it for $60 is obviously not viable with the rising budgets in video games, which means that we need to earn money in different ways. And the way people earn money, first was DLC, which was great, because you earn a little bit of extra money, maybe $15 extra, maybe $30 extra, but you still needed to make that DLC. And people get pissed off when they feel like your DLC was made during development, because video games. Um, on the other hand, it turns out that people will happily pay money for outfits and hats if your game is big enough and free. Uh, so you're seeing a move, even in big games, towards free-to-play games, right? Games that are free, that you download, and that then, uh, through engagement, retention, all the stuff that we learned from mobile games, really, uh, earn money through microtransactions. And there's no good reason to not do that because the difference between buying a game once and offering people the ability to spend infinite money on games is, for businesses, obviously a really good deal. I still don't like making those, but I guess I'm part of like the stubborn generation that doesn't want to make that. I guess the standard will move towards that. So here's the thing, for indies to approach this, you really are gonna need somebody in the middle that can handle that stuff for you because we just can't build that infrastructure. There's no way for a small independent developer to just go like, oh, we'll make a, we'll make a like, big online uh, microtransaction. Like you need the data, you need the analytics, you need insight into how people are playing your games, you need to figure out 
where people are where you are losing people, whether you're like keeping people aboard, how's your retention, how's a all of these ridiculous like abbreviations that happened, you know, like ARPU and then ARPUPU, because ARPU was not good enough. Does, is that, did anybody does anybody ARPU? Like average revenue per user? It's a great term, but people figured out that if you take all users, including the users that don't pay, that's a lot of zeros. A lot of people don't pay for a free-to-play game. Uh, so the value was very low. They didn't like that, so they introduced ARPPU, which is average revenue per paying user, because that number is higher and it sounds better in investor meetings. It's great. Only you have to say the word ARPPU, like, <laughs> with a serious face. It's really hard. Um, but yeah, so as an indie, there's no good way to jump into this except for giving another party yet another percentage of your money uh, or paying for them. Which, if somebody can build that platform, go do it. Like, now is a good moment. In like a few years, you're gonna be too late. But if you can't do that, then uh, you're gonna be dependent on somebody else making that. Any other questions about games as a service? Yeah? No, no, Spotify for video games is too late. Uh, the reason it's too late is because Spotify exists. Uh, not because Spotify exists for games, but because everybody has seen that making a Spotify or a Netflix is money. Uh, Steam already did it with stores, but when it comes to downloading games, you see that even now, even with Steam there, a lot of companies are trying to pull away from Steam. You saw it with the announcement of Destiny 2, which is gonna be available only through Battle.net and not through Steam. See with EA, with EA Origin, which we can argue about whether it worked or not. Uh, but everybody wants their own, their own pie. PlayStation is not gonna buy into a service that's run by Microsoft. Microsoft's not gonna buy into a service that's run by PlayStation. There's too much politics and too many people that want that money. So there's no way somebody's gonna be able to build that. Uh, unless you can find like one name or one person or one company that can somehow collect all these people and offer them a large enough audience that they immediately go like, okay, yeah, fair enough. But if even Steam can't convince people to stay on their platform right now, the idea of like a global Netflix for video games becomes rather unlikely. I'm not sure if that's a bad thing or a good thing though. Like I'm okay with not having a Netflix for games. I think so. A lot of companies have been working with episodic content, and I think Square Enix did a lot of good work with Hitman uh, recently, which was very much a, a story-based. I mean, they got rid of IO, but, you know, shit. Um, but Hitman was a really good example of how you can take a game that is content-heavy, single-player, focused, campaign-based, and still introduce a lot of the elements that make games as a service work. So it's not impossible. In, in fact, I think there's a lot of opportunity there if you can create interesting models to use that model, you should work on that now because those models are gonna get replicated and like built upon. So, so here's the thing, I, I, I don't necessarily think that Square Enix getting rid of IO means that the game didn't perform well, right? There's a million different reasons a company can get rid of another company and it doesn't necessarily have to be revenue or income or anything. That's also not, Square Enix didn't mention that it was that reason when they got rid of IO, they just said that it was to focus their efforts, which can mean a million different things, um, including revenue, but it doesn't necessarily is that way. Um, the other thing is I think in general, when people get something new, they push back on it. Steam was first pushed back on. Like the games industry, even though the industry might be relatively progressive, the, the audience is usually very slow to pick up on things. They dislike things that they don't know. And the things that they do like usually have a pushback later on when it, doesn't, when it turns out that it can't somehow like make all their dreams magically happen, like Kickstarter, right? So there's always a pushback against anything new, whether it's immediate or later, it doesn't really matter. But if you look at the numbers, if you look at the data, people are using the model more than they're giving it credit for. Either all of the people that are on forums are not the people paying money for video games, 
or all of, the, all of the people on forums are saying they're going to boycott Call of Duty and then playing it anyway. Like, it's one or the other, but it, the numbers don't lie, and, you know, it's an industry. People vote with their wallet. Again, as an indie, I'm one of the stubborn people, and I guess a lot of people in this audience are too, that just want to make a game, get money for it, and then make a new game, which, hey, entirely fair. Uh, it's just, if you look at, since this topic is up, if you look at the industry honestly and objectively in terms of numbers, yeah, people are upset about it. Will that change in a few years when that's basically the standard? Yes, it will change. It's just how it goes. If people don't want it, don't buy it. Then it will go away. To just do. Any other questions about this? Or shall we move to a more fun subject? It's actually not more fun. This is also a devastatingly sad subject. You all have some pretty sad questions. Uh, so let's talk about marketing. Yay. Uh, who here is making a commercial game right now? Who here wants to pitch their game right now? Wow. Zero? Yeah, you can pay. I know that. That's why I'm not asking you. Uh, but you're also the only one who wants to pitch, I think. Yeah? Nobody else? OK, how about you do it? Go ahead. Yeah, pitch your game. That's pretty good. Um, so no pitch is probably the worst pitch you could poss possibly give. So that was pretty bad, all of you. Um, here's the thing, marketing is really hard. And it's only getting harder because there's more of us. Uh, if I had given this talk in Poland like seven years ago, this hall would have been smaller. Uh, things are getting harder. They're not getting easier. And marketing is not getting easier either because there's more of us competing for the same space. And yes. Technically, indies help each other, and technically, we cooperate and work together and share our resources and share our contacts, and that's beautiful, and it's one of the parts I love about the indie scene. The problem is the press only has this much space to write about our games, and even though Twitch has been great in that regard, in that people can reach their own niche when they want to, um, and if they do the work for it, uh, and if they get lucky, um, it hasn't been getting easier. So. How many of you have a press kit for your game? OK. Does everybody know what a press kit is? Does somebody want me to explain what a press kit is? That's OK. OK. So the idea of a press kit is basically a, a single place where people from the press can find information about your game. And it's where you put your screenshots. It's where you put your description, short description, long description, feature list, trailers, stuff like that. The reason you make that is simple. If the press wants to write about your game, they can find that information. If they can't find that information, they'll just write about something else, right? Because emailing you is going to take three days, and they have to deliver the, the article, to, like, now. Um, the other reason you do that is so that people don't use shit screenshots that other people make. Because if you go look for some games that don't have a press kit, one of the funniest things is seeing developers really upset on Twitter that people keep using the same shitty screenshot over and over. And the simple reason is it was just the first result that came up on Google. Right, somebody had to write an article, they found a screenshot, they cropped it a little bit differently so it's not the same image, and they posted it on the website. That's how it goes. And then three people use it, and then everybody uses it. Um, and that's just kind of how it goes. So if you, you want to make sure that people use the best possible screenshots, the best usable images, the best possible trailers, you make your own press kit, and you make sure that you have the best screenshots. If you're making a game, for those of you that have a press kit, how many of you spend like more than a day making screenshots? Of course. Uh, yeah, the, the reason is very simple. How much time do you spend on a video game? Months? Years? Why are you going to slack off on your screenshots? You spend like weeks getting that little UI element to twinkle just right, then you have one shot to sell your game for the first time, and you make a shit screenshot? The amount of times I get a pitch from somebody where the screenshot is like the most bland thing. You look at it and you're like, what kind of fucking genre is this video game? Is it a platform? Is it a shooter? I can't tell whether it's a first person shooter or a third person RPG. What is happening? Right? Super common. The amount of pitches I get from people who are like, can you look at my pitch? And I'm like, well, I looked at your screenshot and it's shit. So let's start with that. It's incredible. Make a good screenshot. For Vlaambeer games, we literally, we play our game while the game exports screenshots every 10 frames. And we just play. 
And then at the end, we have thousands of screenshots. We go through them one by one. We go, this is cool, this is cool, this is cool, this is bad. And then we end up with like 20 hours of gameplay. We end up with 20, and we do that a few days in a row. And then we have 100, 150 screenshots, and we go, this one is good. And then we throw away the other 149, and we do it again until we have five good screenshots. It takes weeks sometimes to get the screenshots we want. But we're doing it during development, so it's not taking that much time. It's just you have to remember, have to think about this. Is your screenshot good? Trailers, same thing. A lot of people, they make a trailer, they open up fucking Windows Movie Maker, they throw together a bunch of like, videos they took during like, an afternoon of gaming, and they go, well, this is a trailer. And it's like, no, that's not a trailer. You get one chance to sell your game for the first time. One chance. One chance that people look at the trailer and go, like, I want this or I don't want this. I care or I do not care. Or even in worst cases, this is shit. I don't want to deal with this game. So get that right. How many of you have emailed the press recently? In any form. Did that go well? Did it go well? Uh, kind, of. kind of. So you got a few responses. It, it went well, but I'm not sure if it is because of our app or because of uh, our publisher. So yeah. You have a publisher. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. good. Um, I mean, here's, an, here's another question I get a lot. Is it OK as an indie to have a publisher? Who thinks that's OK? Hey, the answer is yes, it's okay. I li like the word indie literally means you're independent. You shouldn't give a shit what everybody else thinks. That's the, the entire idea of what we're doing. The reason we went independent is because we want to make games our own way. If that includes a publisher because you don't want to deal with the marketing, go for it. If people say Minecraft is indie, who the fuck cares? Let them be. If people say EA is indie, EA says they're indie sometimes. Start as an indie company. Well, technically they're right. Are they still indie? Who gives a shit? What's important is the idea of indie is that you make games the way you want, right? And that means dealing with the problems, it means dealing with the challenges, it means dealing with the opportunities. And if you want to just focus on making your game and not deal with the marketing, get a publisher. If you have no idea what you're doing and you'd rather that your few years of investment go towards, you know, a game that might actually sell well, get a publisher. If you, if you want to get a publisher for one game and then never again, that's fine. I see a lot of indies that use a publisher for their first game, and then if things go well and they, have a, they end up with a shit ton of money somehow, they just don't work with a publisher again. That's fine too. It doesn't really matter. You just make games the way you want. And the entire idea that there's a right way of making video games, you should use this, you should use that. Be a nice human, help other people make video games. Indie, cool. Um, so publishers, okay. If you email the press, the most important thing that I can tell you is your first sentence needs to say everything. And I don't mean write a really long first sentence. I mean, tell them what the name of the game is, the platform, why they should give a shit, and if you have it, a release date. Just those things. Like, some of you are making a commercial game, right? Who was making a commercial game? Okay, you. In, in the back right there. Sure. I mean, you said me, so it's you. Um, what is, just give us in one sentence. What is your game? So how many of you think that sounds cool? Yeah. Just if, or interesting in any way. How many of you want to look, look up this game? It's okay. Okay, how many of you would know what to Google for? Zero? Yeah. That's a problem. Even the people that want to know about the game don't know how to find it. Okay, anybody else? Who wants to go? Yeah, go. Who thinks that sounds cool? Who knows what to Google for? What's it called? Hey. Is it available yet? No, it's already on Steam, but not available. Steam? Oh, I thought it was an iOS game. Sorry? I thought it was an iOS game. Oh, you didn't mention that. Would be good to know what it's on. 
Name will be good, platform will be good. If you have a price release date, whether it's available right now or not, stuff like that is good to know. If I tell, let's talk about my games, I don't know if you've noticed, but if I say Nuclear Throne is a top-down roguelike, I start with the fucking name. First thing I say, Nuclear Throne. Even if you're half paying attention, you might hear that. If I have two sentences, I'll just say Nuclear Throne in every sentence. Nuclear Throne is, Nuclear Throne is available on, Nuclear Throne is out now. Just because people forget. People forget things really fast. Ridiculous Fishing is a game about fishing with machine guns. It's right at the start. Luftrausers is a game about being the best fighter pilot in the world and the best airplane in the world. It's right at the start. Start with the name of your game. No reason not to. And a lot of people forget that. A lot of people don't do that. A lot of people start with, hey, we haven't emailed in a long time. I hope you're doing well. You know what I would do if I got 700 emails and every email started with that sentence? Skip all of those. Don't start with that. People are journalists. They know that you have news. They know that you want them to write about something. You can be polite. You can be friendly. Just get to the news. Start with the news, not the other stuff. They don't want to search through a 20-page email about your history and your life. It's great. You can put that at the end of the email. Just start with the news, please. OK? Any other questions about that? Because I have like eight slides left. Good question. So should you attach screenshot? Even video, yes. Or video. Answer is inconclusive. Um, yes, it is a good idea to have graphical images. No, sometimes email servers reject that, and that includes some of the larger press where they just don't get the email because they reject images. Uh, a good way of doing it is have an HTML version and have a text version, and figure out which one you should use for what pub publication. If unsure, use an HTML version and have a link to all of this information. Again, a press, kit, uh, a press kit version will work, or a press kit link will work. I made something called Do Press Kit, which is free, and you can use it to make a website with all of this information on it. Um, but generally, I tend to go with text only. Other people go with images. Other people go with embed video. It doesn't really matter. Just try and see what you get response on. Any other questions about this? Any other people who want to try giving a pitch? I have a question. OK, question. When should you start doing this, basically? Ah, when should you start doing marketing? We start doing marketing. The, honestly, we start doing our marketing work the moment the game gets, gets made as an idea. So if we start on a project, one of the first conversations we have is what is the angle on this game? Like, what is interesting? How can we talk to the press? What can people care about? What is interesting about the game? What is interesting about where the studio is? What is interesting about what the inspiration of the game is? What is the story of this game? Because don't forget, the press and you, you have a similar goal, which is you want to bring good, good games to people. The difference is that you're trying to do it with your game, and they're trying to do it with news and stories. So just a game is not enough to get attention from the press. It's a mistake a lot of people make where they think, I make a good game, I send it to the press, and now it's a story. That's not a story. A story is a story. It is something interesting, something human, something personal, something interesting about the history of your game, what the game is, how the game works, how the game is doing, anything really, just not just a game. That's not a story. So help people out find that story. Like if you have stories, give people a few pointers. And for us, when we have a version of the game that is playable, we start showing it to press. Um, just as a, like, at an event or something, we just go like, hey, here, this is, it's not, we're not talking about this yet, but give it a go. Uh, it'll be a few months, it'll be half a year, it'll be a year before it's ready, but, you know, maybe you'll like it. Um, which is nice. And then about three months before release, we start sort of pushing. Uh, that's for us, that's sort of where the press marketing push happens. Uh, release can be both early access or like actual release. So sometimes a release is an early access release and then you get those three months to do marketing. If you do early access, please remember that that means your game is out. And that it's really hard to get people to give a shit about your actual release. A lot of people think that early access is cool because you get two releases. You don't. You get the first one and it's when your game is still broken. Uh, so if you want to do an early access launch and you want a second launch, make sure you have something really seriously cool for the launch that people can talk about. Um, for Nuclear Throne, what we ended up doing, because the game had been in early access for two and a half years, we launched it on PlayStation. So that we had, on launch, we had news. 
So we could say, hey, it's coming out on PlayStation for the first time ever, we made a big deal out of that. And then also, it is now the 1.0 for PC. So make sure you have news. Wow, that table makes noise. So I'm gonna move on to slide three if there's more questions and I have time left. Uh, QA for indie games. Oh yeah, this is the slide where I cry. Um, so how many of you do formal QA? Any form of QA? Yeah, three of you for, yeah, we do two, sort of. Um, yeah, do QA. <laughs> Seriously, it's, it, the amount of times we've made games where afterwards we look at something and go, oh, for fuck's sake. We should get more professional about this. Uh, is every game we've ever released. Uh, it's genuinely, it's, QA is hard. There's professionals that do this for you. There's even professionals in the country here that do it. That's a good pitch. Well done. Uh, find people who can do QA and do QA. If you're launching on consoles, that's extra true. I don't know how many of you have released on console. Oh, we're gonna talk about this in the platform slide. I'll talk about that later. Um, but in general, make sure you have some form of formal QA where you can send the game, get like reports back and fix those reports. And don't just get somebody who says, I play video games, get somebody who knows the platform you're gonna be releasing on. Because there's a lot of rules, there's a lot of weird edge cases, there's a lot of stuff that you have to think about and it's gonna save you a lot of time. Any questions about QA? Actually, if you have questions about QA, there's a QA person in the room, you should ask her. Working with mobile platforms. So this is, I could have, yeah. <sighs> Remember when mobile earned tons of money? Those were good times. Um, those are not necessarily the times anymore. Uh, again, every platform is kind of dealing with this, but it's mostly because there's just too many of us. Um, the last experience we have working with mobile platforms was Ridiculous Fishing back in 2013. I'm sure all of you that are releasing on mobile have sort of kept up with the news. Uh, premium is doing worse than ever. It still does well every now and then. Free to play is doing really good for the few big companies that have done it very successfully. Uh, everybody else is kind of stuck. That's kind of it. If you want to work on mobile platforms, sort of the same rules still apply. If you want to launch, make sure you get a feature. The feature doesn't do as much as it did before, but it's still there. If you're making a game for Apple, make sure you have an Apple contact. This, how many of you are making mobile games? How many of you have an Apple contact or a person they can talk to at Apple? So there's ways to get those. And one of them is actually submitting a feedback request when you're uh, submitting your app. If you get into review queue, you can actually send an email to Apple. It's like at the bottom of the website somewhere. Do that. If you know anybody who has made a successful iOS game, reach out to them and ask if they would introduce you to somebody. Having an Apple contact is huge because you get to send your game to them a few weeks in before launch, preferably about three weeks. And then the last week you will get an email that says, or you might get an email that says, we may have you as a feature, send the next shit in the next 12 hours or we will ignore you forever. Uh, because that's kind of how it goes. Um, if you then do that, you may or may not be featured. The biggest thing is an Apple contact will try to sell you all of their big features of the moment. So if you're making a game and you want it featured on Apple, one of their big things right now is the haptic feedback. Make sure your game has the haptic feedback, right? It's all the integrations with their platform. It's their cross-safe platform. It's all of that stuff. If you don't have that, they're not even gonna look at your game for featuring. On top of that, they are really big on localization at the moment. If you're not localizing in at least eFigs, Brazilian Portuguese and simplified Chinese, they will usually not feature you. So if you're making a game, make sure you keep track of your localization and your ability to localize your game because holy shit, it's annoying to like integrate localization after you're done making a game. For Android, it's a bit different. It's a lot easier to get an Android contact. A lot of them are just on, on Twitter and they actually just have their title in their name. Uh, Maria Essig is a very well-known one. You can find her and she's cool. Um, there's a lot of Google people that you can just reach out to. Uh, ask them what they would like. Their feature is less effective than the Apple one, but any feature helps. If you're developing for mobile, I would recommend developing for both. If you're developing for both, unless you can get a feature from one of them, launch on both at the same time, unless you can't deal with the feedback or support for that. Android is way worse in terms of support. 
uh, you will get way more angry complaints because you're releasing a game on like 1,400 different SKUs at the same time effectively. Uh, and it will not work, your game will not work on that one Android phone that has a diagonal screen, because who the fuck makes a phone with a diagonal screen? Um, but it will not work and you will get an angry email about it. We did, it was great. This is, this is the worst email to get, it's like, your game doesn't work on my phone, it's like, what phone do you have? And they sent back this weird thing and it's like a little jewelry box with a diagonal screen on it, and you're like, what the fuck? What is this? Why is there Android on a jewelry box? This is amazing. Um, yeah, and he was such an ass about it too. Anyway, video games. Uh, any questions about mobile platforms? No? All right, who here has a business model? It's a shit question because it kind of doesn't mean anything really. It's like your business model is you make money through a predictive model of how you're going to do money, money making, right? Uh, some people have like a very set definition of business model, which is good because it means you've thought about this. In general, most people will have no good answer to this question because their answer to what is your business model is please make money somehow. Not a good business model. Uh, if you want to think about how you're going to make money, you want to think about this way in advance, you want to think about this seriously, and you want to have an answer that's better than free to play or premium. Those are not business models. Well, they are business models. They're not spe specific applicable business models. So think about where you're going to sell your game. How much do they take from your game? Uh, do they take a cut? Like, you're not allowed to say how much money Steam takes, but I'm sure if you've released a Steam game, you know it's like more than 29 and less than 31%. Um, like, when you make games, you have to keep in mind that there's a lot of things that are gonna take money from you. And just saying like, we have a game that costs $12, so we need to sell 100,000 units. That's not a business model. That's a hope, that's a dream. What are you gonna do if you don't hit that? Are you gonna go sales? Are you not gonna do sales? The price, what, what amount of money are you selling your game for? If it's less than $15, recently there was uh, Mike Rose, who is really good at parsing all these numbers, basically said if you're selling your game for less than $15, you might as well sell it for $15. Because the difference between 10 and 15 is nothing. There doesn't seem to be any drop off between $11 and $15, so you're cheating yourself out of $4. How many of you are selling between 10 and 15? Yeah, I am. It's hard to go like, oh, we launched it at 12, now it's 15, sorry. Um, this kind of stuff is good to look into. It's good to look into up front. If you're putting a price point up for your game, keep sales in mind. What is 75% of your price? Is that still a good number? Because that's how much Steam is gonna ask of you to be in any sale at any given time. Is there gonna be like, oh, are you gonna go 50 to 75%? If not, there's a bunch of other games that are doing that. They're basically making us bid against each other. It's like an auction. Who wants to sell their game for less? And hey, it's a good way to make money, so you can't, you know, can't blame them. But um, when you think about these things, please keep in mind all of that stuff. Keep in mind that if you are budgeting your game, you shouldn't just budget your game. You should also budget the next, like, three to six months as you're coming up with new shit. The amount of indies that come to us asking for, we're out of money, we're two months away from launching, what do we do, is heartbreaking. But there's an enormous amount of indie developers that end up going to publishers with just two months of development left or three months of development left because they ran out of money, because they didn't expect a delay or something, and then they end up getting a really shit deal from the publisher because the publisher knows that they won't be able to finish the game otherwise. It's a lot, this is not a few cases, this is, I get dozens of these a year. Probably more. Yeah, like nine, this, like nine in the next, nine in the, until now, of people that just got really shit deals. And then a bunch of people that got deals that were okay, but really they shouldn't have, shouldn't have needed them. Budgeting is impossible, as a side note. Like, it's the, in, it's the games industry. A lot of things are weird and unpredictable. That doesn't mean you shouldn't give it your best fucking shot. Include your salary, include your own salary, include your co-worker's salary, make sure that you pay people wage, make sure that you pay your freelancers, make sure that you have all of this ready and make sure that your 
your revenue prediction sort of aligns with that. And then keep in mind that revenue predictions also suck. Revenue predictions are like a programmer saying something will take two weeks. It's never true. It's just not how it works. So keep that in mind. It's all, honestly, a lot of this is just sort of a weird magic. It's like you, you have to seriously, seriously try and then still hope it works out. So make your best case scenario, make your worst case scenario. Make sure you're ready for both. Any questions about this? How many of you have like a good budget for their current game? <laughs> good. Uh, do you? <laughs> Okay, um, and on average, like you should probably not, for most commercial indie games right now, if you're under a hundred grand, good luck. Uh, and that's if you include salaries for everybody, okay? Uh, so that's not a you should have a hundred grand, it's just the value of the work that's gonna go into this project is probably gonna be about a hundred to 300,000 US dollars. I don't know if working here is a different, you know, um, if labor here costs more or less. Um, if so, adjust for that. But that's where most indie games nowadays sort of fall. Just so you know, that's what you're up against. How many of you work with freelancers and outside companies? Well, also not a lot. Um, so working with freelancers or are you, how many of you are freelancers? <laughs> you work with freelancers and you are not a freelancer. Nice. Um, so working with freelancers, check all the local laws on how to work with freelancers and what rights they have. If you're gonna work with a freelancer, make sure you have a contract that defines what work they need to do, what is gonna happen if they don't do the work, how much they're gonna get paid, and how long that contract will be valid. The last one is kind of an important one. There's a lot of cases where I come across indies that come to me and say, hey, listen, we have a freelancer who's being an ass. We've been paying them for like five years and there's like a week of accounting that we need to do every time. And then we pay them $12. And we wanna stop paying those $12 and stop doing the like months, the weeks of work every time. But they have a contract and they're keeping us to us and they're saying that they, we can buy them out if we want to get rid of them for a ridiculous amount. That's not an uncommon thing. The truth is most freelancers are super good people and super good to work with. Um, if you're gonna work with a freelancer, please tell them that it's okay to tell you that they're not gonna hit a deadline. It's a very weird thing, but a lot of freelancers are kind of nervous about saying that they're not gonna hit something. Technically, that's the freelancer's responsibility. It's a good idea to tell them anyway, to let them know, hey, if there's any problems, if you run into anything, if you have you know, delays, personal situations, please just let me know so we can keep track of it in our, in our schedule. Let freelancers know that. Uh, also, generally, it's a good idea to make sure that freelancers feel involved in your project, so if you don't have a Slack or another group chat where they can post their progress and be part of the progress of the rest of your team, having something like that is usually useful. Uh, if you're outsourcing, outsourcing is a bit of a different beast. Uh, a lot of people think that outsourcing will make their work easier. Not necessarily true. In many cases, outsourcing is just as much work. It's just different work. It's managing, QA, testing, making sure everybody's doing their work, making sure the payments go out, stuff like that. Unless it is a significant part of your work that you need to do, outsourcing is not necessarily easier. So keep in mind that outsourcing comes with a lot of work as well as that it can take a lot of work away from you. Don't just outsource because you can. Outsource because it's necessary. Um, if you are a freelancer, good things to check if you're going to work with a company is in the contract. Do they have rules for whose uh, rights the work are going to be? Uh, if you disagree with that, negotiate with them. Uh, is payment, is that clearly defined? Is there a due date for payments? Does it say after you invoice us, we need to pay within this many days? Is there a way for you to get out of the contract if they turn out to be giant assholes? It's a good one to have. Um, and then what happens to the rights of your stuff? And what happens if the entire thing just fails? If they don't pay you, if they don't take care of you, if the game turns out to be horrible or not what you expected, um, what happens? So make sure that those things are defined really well because 
again, freelancers get screwed over by games companies a lot as well. Um, and again, most companies are not horrible, but shit happens. Any questions about this? I'm hearing like noises that seem to suggest that I need to hurry up. No? So best platform to release on, for now it is still Steam. Still the case. Um, that doesn't mean it's easy. Uh, PlayStation is still pretty good. ID at Xbox is getting better and better. Switch suddenly gives a shit. So Nintendo listening is nice. That's new. Um, if you want to do Switch development, now is a good time, although you're probably slightly too late unless you're going to port something. Um, doesn't mean you shouldn't. Uh, iOS is a shit show. Again, premium is overtaken by people that have a lot of money, and free-to-play is overtaken by people who have a lot of data. Android has always kind of been a shit show, but hey, why the fuck not? Uh, Windows Mobile, don't do it. Uh, Ouya, don't do it. Uh, any small PC platforms or bundles or stuff like that, generally not worth it unless your game is already doing well. Um, they're very little work usually, but a lot of them come with a lot of paperwork. So it's up to you to kind of figure out whether you want to release on those. Uh, if you want to release on itch.io, I would recommend that, mostly because I really like itch.io, so I'm a little bit biased. Um, am I forgetting any platforms? If you're going to hit PC, hit Mac, hit Linux. Uh, Amazon? Amazon is interesting. It's not there yet, but it's, they're definitely looking and trying, and they're one of the largest sales companies in the world, so who knows? They might, they might work their shit out. Uh, for now, it's one of those platforms that falls under the if it's, if it's, if it's effective to port to, port to it, and otherwise, uh, don't. Uh, for a lot of these cases, the honest answer is use common sense. See how much money it's going to take, how much time and money it's going to take to port. If you don't know how much money and time it's going to port, ask somebody who does know. We thought that PlayStation would be really easy because it was just a few fixes in GameMaker to get it running, and then we were stuck for six months in certification because it turns out that there's certification. We didn't know that. Um, in many cases, please ask people. Please ask people what the platform is like, how the process works. Talk to somebody from the platform to see if the information other people have is outdated, and then go from there. I wish. Uh, VR is, is awesome, and I love it. And I think if you are working on a VR game now and you're going to be done in the next six months to a year, it'll be awesome. Uh, after that, I have no idea, but it's not looking like it's going to be a huge consumer boom in the next few years. Uh, if they're going to hit it, they're going to have to hit it before cooler shit than VR hits. And that might be sooner than we think. So if you're doing VR right now, cool. If you're doing VR right now and making money, Holy shit. Uh, if you're al alchemy, then congratulations, you are the winner. And if you're not alchemy, like, I don't see the market. I'm sure it's there, but it's, it's hard right now and it's only going to get worse. Um, doesn't mean don't do it. Again, if you have something that is really different, that is really interesting, if you can still make yourself to a, f to a force in VR, if you genuinely think your product is that good, go for it. If you're looking for an existing market, if you looked at the numbers, PlayStation VR is currently still the best-selling one. You can look up the numbers for that. They released some numbers on that recently. There's not that many units, and a lot of the units that are sold are probably sitting somewhere like the Wii U was for a lot of people, or the Ouya. It's better than Ouya, though. I've got to give them that. That's nice. Is anybody sad about this? I'm sad about this. I really wanted VR to be awesome. It's, so, it's such cool technology. It's really good if you're an architect or a doctor or something. But Okay, any questions about VR? Anybody who wants to tell me I'm wrong? Good, okay. At least one person still believes in it. Um, in the apocalypse. Good news, in the apocalypse is bullshit. India has always been hard. Uh, it's just there's more of us now, so it looks like it's worse. It's just the ratio is the same. 
like a tiny percentage of everybody who starts on this succeeds. It's just it's easier for us to read the stories about the people that don't make it. Um, which means that, yeah, the indie apocalypse is real and it has been real since indie started, so shit. Um, the reality for this is, in general, indie games don't do super well. And this is the reality that you have to face if you're going to be an independent developer. It's not easy. I've done a talk about this called You Don't Stand a Chance. If you want to get really sad about indie games, go listen to that one. Uh, the thing is, if you're in indie games, you're probably in indie games because you give a shit, and you care, and you're passionate about games, and you want to make something of your own, and that's a really good fucking reason to be here. If you're here to become rich, don't go out, get out. Go do something that makes money, because there's a lot of things that make money. If you can get to the point where you break even, that's awesome. If you can get to the point where you can make a profit, congratulations, you're one of very few. If you get to the point where you can make a living out of this, holy shit. Indie games is hard, has always been hard, will remain hard, but one of the cool things about indie games is that we're really adaptive and really flexible. So whenever something new happens, look at it and see if there's an opportunity. Whenever you see something that I'm not seeing, go do that. Don't ask me what you should do right now. Listen to what I'm saying, anything that I'm not talking about. Go do that stuff. Anything that anybody, that everybody in the press is not talking about, go do that stuff. Go find the place where nobody is making stuff because I can't see those. I've been here for, well, not as long as some people in the room, but I've been here for a decade or something. I have a, I have a perspective. I have the perspective of Lambier. We have a history, we have a context. This is what we make. And I look at everything, but I, I'm stuck in this frame. If you're starting out right now, you see things that I can't see, use those. That's what we did when we started. That's what you should do if you want to, you know, survive in the eternal in the apocalypse. These are cool. Roguelikes are cool. Uh, they're also, don't start making a roguelike now. Please don't start making a roguelike. Uh, it's the, kind of the same thing if everybody is doing it right now. If you start on working on one right now, you're going to be three years late by the time you're done. Whatever is popular right now, don't make it. Okay, whatever you hear in a talk is outdated. Because if somebody can talk about it, they've had the time to look at the results, think about them, and make a talk about them. If somebody tells you right now this is the best platform like I just did, chances are that's information from a few months ago and things might be different already. One of the most exciting and cool things about the games industry is that nobody actually knows. We have experience, we have gut feelings, we have like trends, but the honest, the honest truth is, Three years ago, four years ago, nobody would have thought VR was even a conversation topic. And by now we've gone through the cycle of, holy shit, VR is gonna be awesome. Holy shit, VR is here. This roller coaster thing is awesome. What's happening? Why are there no games? What's next? AR looks really cool. Like, in three years, we've gone through that entire cycle. That's video games. That's why the question, why do you th where do you see yourself in five years in this industry, makes no fucking sense. Because nobody knows. We're on the cutting edge of technology and culture and art and video games. They all change so fast that if you see something now and you go, oh, I should do that too, get rid of that thought. Don't do that too. Because two is too late. By the time you're seeing it, it's three years old. Anything that people are saying right, that people are talking about right now, will be in games three years from now. They won't be now, and three years from now will be too late. But roguelikes are really cool. Any questions about roguelikes? Okay, let's go to the really rapid, uh, there is a camera, so we're not doing that. Uh, let's do a really quick Q&A. Uh, do I have like Q&A time? Like three minutes. Three minutes, three nice. Minutes. Any questions, can be about anything. Don't ask me about my breakfast. Where is your next so uh, when we're talking about questions you shouldn't ask of people. <laughs> Sorry. Your next game is a tough one because the honest truth is if I would be able to talk about it, I would have mentioned it at the start of the presentation. If I am working on one but I haven't mentioned it at the start of the presentation, I have to answer no right now. And if I'm not making a game, I also have to answer no. So the honest truth is, I'm going to answer no.
It's one of those questions that it's like, whatever happens, it's always no. <laughs> it's always worth asking, though. It's always good to ask. Any other questions that I have to answer no to? Yeah. We're staying with Game Maker Studio for now, uh, but mostly because we're doing a lot of maintenance work. Uh, plus, Game Maker Studio 2 is in active development, and we have learned from our little adventure with making games on a platform that is in active development for our console that is also in active development, that that's a bad idea, and don't do it unless you really have to. Uh, so we're staying with a stable platform for a little bit as we work on maintenance. We're out of time. Good. If anybody has any other questions, wants to talk, has anything they want to try, want to pitch, anything, I'm the top account on Twitter there. Uh, if you want to keep track of the work we're doing and maybe learn about potential new games we might or might not be making, that's the bottom account. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Ramin. Thank you for the presentation. <laughs>